think you recognise everybody here. And um, our topic, in case you don't have the paper to hand, is how will the Health Research Partnership transform health and care for the people of Brighton and Sussex? So, can we invite questions from the audience, first of all? Yes, one over here. Okay, I'm David Bloomfield. I'm a clinical oncologist locally. Um, my question may be relevant to this bit of the talk or later in the day, but um, I, I mean, I've always found that having um, a specific problem to solve solves, unlocks a bigger, a bigger picture. Uh, one of my roles is I'm chair of the Sussex Cancer Fund, which is a, a local effective charity. We've been trying to get a critical mass of three or so MD Roses PhDs over the last six years or so. And there's a couple of really niggly things which I'd hope that today would sort out. One is just accountancy. Uh, we've got a lay accountant, uh, well, a lay treasurer, and we submit, um, well, salary um, to tr the trust or the university. There's no idea what's coming back or when, and just having someone who would actually keep a forensic accountancy role so that we don't worry about overspending, underspending, being charged twice. Um, so that would be really good. We're also struggling with the NIHR partnership role, um, and we need advice on that. We find it hard to find where that's coming from. And many of our local oncologists are not able to act as supervisors for our MD residents, and I don't fully understand why. So I would hope that this thing today, and that's only you know, three MD reses in one department, but I would hope we could sort all this out through the sort of structure we're hearing about today. Martin, do you want to come in? And then perhaps we could hear about adjunct um, faculty. So I hear everything you say. Um, don't, so I think, um, yeah, actually maybe that's the right way to do it. I was struck by a couple of the solutions that we heard Richard talking about, really. And I think we've got a number of themes for career development, uh, as, as, as you know, for, for research development at the, at the Trust, and that it interacts with the medical school. And I think the idea of having an overarching structure which allows us to support those different pathways would be, would be very uh, appealing, really. Richard, do you want to comment on that? Uh, uh, so, a um, couple of things. We, we don't have a perfect solution. The adjunct appointments uh, are pertinent to that supervision uh, piece, um, which is for us usually uh, uh, colleagues who are wanting to uh, play a supervisory role, particularly in PhDs as opposed to MRES. But it can and does capture that. Uh, it, it, we, we, you know, many universities, probably most universities, have shifted the dial in wanting to make sure that there is a, a very high degree of appropriate supervision. So the adjunct appointments is an effective way of uh, ensuring that that is covered. The, the point I think you were getting to, which we still do fall over on, there's a number of smaller charities who want to work with us. Um, and just if I could say a couple of words that are relevant to this, but perhaps just to, to frame it. Uh, each of our partners has their own independent uh, fundraising activities. So, uh, and uh, what we sought to do early on was to get the partners to work together and identify one lead fundraising uh, group to work on behalf of the whole partnership. The partners fund pay into that to co cover the cost of the infrastructure. And that really, uh, that, that has, and it turns out that we use the university's fundraising infrastructure. Each of the partners makes a contribution to that. It has elevated our return on investment uh, uh, significantly, but not, um, not to a point where everybody feels satisfied. And that's partly because there's fluctuation as to where you see big donor uh, uh, income come in. I illustrated you know, the building I illustrated, um, the Morris Wall building, you know, that was a 25 million donation. And so, of course, folk in the neurosciences felt they were getting a great return on investment. And if you were, if you were in a King's College Hospital in hematology, you'd be thinking, hang on, what am I getting out of this? But it means you have got a very profound infrastructure when you have an opportunity to go after particularly protracted interactions with potential donors, because those things don't happen instantly. 
each of the trusts have uh, other smaller uh, charitable arms. And we do run into just the problem that you've alluded to as to how do you ensure that um, you know, the necessary accounting is, is managed. We do operate that through this single portal of fundraising so they get support. Uh, so smaller charities are wishing to work with us are supported through that. Um, it, it's not a perfect uh, arrangement, but it certainly is one that has allowed us to navigate some of the problems you've alluded to. I'm Director of Research at BSMS. I'm working closely with my colleague, Director of Doctoral Studies at BSMS as well. I don't think Sandra's here. Okay, so a couple of things I wanted to say. Firstly, in, in answer to the, the person who just asked the question, David Bumbo. Yes, you can supervise a PhD student, but it needs to be an honorary contract. And these can be set up relatively easily. So I can talk to you about that af afterwards. But the th main thing I wanted to say was that I'm not sure if people are aware that there's a huge amount of training available for PhD students registered at Sussex or Brighton, um, and also for postdoctoral people um, asked to go through Sussex because they're Sussex employed. But uh, the research staff could be this huge amounts of, of training available. Now, it might be that specific training is needed for clinical people, but there is a huge amount of basic training available. And if the students are registered at BSMS, which is through Brighton in our case, or even at Sussex, that PhD training would be available to them. So I think that's really quite an easy way that these, uh, the, the clinical PhD students can get the training. And you can request courses as well. So, you know, that is another way to get training. And in terms of the postdoctoral, there's a lot of workshop skills courses going on. And so there's quite a lot available. And I think, it, you know, using that, but possibly a little bit of extra clinical, you know, you'll be there, basically. So I can talk about the... Um, and the other thing about the PhDs is we want... To, Sandra, Sacra and I want to make sure that the PhDs are properly supervised and that the supervisor teams have proper expertise, because otherwise the students can fall by the wayside. And, of course, that's not good for anybody. So we are trying to make sure that there's proper supervisory expertise there so that the students have a good experience uh, and get the skills and get the papers they want for their next step of the career. Thanks, Thank you. And, um, I mean, did you want to talk, Nikki, about sort of what you will be doing in the capacity work stream there? Um, well, yeah, I think it's, like we said in, the, in my presentation, it's about pulling all that together and finding out where the gaps are and for whom, um, you know, it's fine if you're on a registered program of training, but actually there's a lot of, especially professions allied to medicine, that perhaps are not on a formalised training program, so don't have access to all that, um, all those resources. So um, we need to look at, you know, how we can bring all that together and making sure that there's um, consistency and uniformity in the training that we provide, because I think there are gaps for certain professional groups. Thanks, Nikki. Um, Natalie Edelman. Hi there. Um, yeah, my, um, I was struck by thinking about the fact that we're in a landscape now where the NIHR is moving towards health and social care research, where we're also recognising the impact of social inequalities on participating in research. And to do really wide-scale research, we need a lot of people to be taking part. So PPI is actually something it's actually grown to something much broader, which is about research engagement. So given that sort of background, I wondered um, what the HRP were planning in terms of supporting career development for non-clinical people. Because while non-clinical is obviously very important, there's an awful lot of people in social sciences and also a lot of allied health professions, as, um, as um, Professor Trembath raised, that I think could really benefit from support alongside clinical people. So I wondered if you could comment on that. Thank you. Thanks. And of course, um, most people working in social care are not registered professionals. And Nikki, would you like to come in on that? Well, I think uh, Martin might want to comment about the, the new partnerships and working more, looking outside the box, basically. Maybe we have been too focused on clinical, but as one of Martin's slides said, you know, you've got engineering, you've got social care, you've got the social work department, and actually 
we will need to be engaging more with all our partners. I don't know if Richard, if you've got... Uh, I, I completely agree. And if, if I had one comment, and I don't want to be accused of not being very supportive of NIHR and now uh, 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 social care component, I, I, I think if, if you, the reason that you want to be doing that and getting that breadth of engagement is that's going to allow you to be uh, in the strongest position to develop your, 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 your USPs in the most effective way. I wouldn't do it because NIHR have mapped it out for you, because that will constrain you in a way of your, in, in your imaginative thinking. So, I mean, of course you want to make sure that as a consequence you can align it. And I don't think that's what you were suggesting in any kind of way, but I just wanted, I, I had meant to mention that free yourself up from just thinking I'll map this exactly to what they are asking for, because you'll, you'll miss some uh, uh, creative opportunities, I would suggest. If, if I, oh, sorry, where are you? Thank you. No. Hi. Uh, yes, you can hear me. My name is Samira. I'm from, I'm a researcher from the Clinical Imaging Sciences Centre here in Falmer. Um, actually, a cheeky plug. We have a very good poster about uh, all our facilities and what we can do. So come and uh, see us and talk to us. Um, my question is um, about the early career researchers, particularly the, clini uh, the clinicians. So, um, are there, this is very exciting, this HR, HRP, but I was wondering whether there are any practical, concrete schemes for uh, training and supporting, particularly the early career researchers, the clinicians, particularly post PhD, to retain them post PhD, basically. Well, I think that's part of the scoping exercise and something we need to develop within the work stream. So there isn't anything yet, but um, be great to have a chat with you about what you think that. Might especially like. post COVID, mm. because uh, especially with time, I mean, they don't, they are overworked and there is no time. So it would be very uh, useful to uh, bear that in mind and come up with solutions for that. Sure, great, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. I'm now going to invoke Chair's privilege to ask a question, which is um, so you can make partnerships between things that exist that have a name on the lid and so on, but actually, some of the really big priorities are clinical pathways, they are um, the community services that we find so hard to define and if anything's going to knock the NHS over this winter it's those things so how do we do partnerships that address those things that are absolutely preoccupying every hospital board and everybody in an ED at the moment and it'd be good to have your perspective from Kings and then um, Martin I, I can be brief uh, we haven't got a solution to that all right the, the pathways we have worked exceptionally hard on uh, we did that initially within the construct of when we formed the partnership. There was a, f there was a brief moment, uh, actually it wasn't that brief, where an awful lot of effort went into uh, saying, would we really achieve the maximum if we brought of those three health trusts together as a single unitary trust? And the reason was that that would be the solution to managing those uh, acute and, and uh, specialist pathways most effectively. We probably spent an awful lot of money looking at whether that was possible and that probably wasn't the most appropriate thing to do. And in any case, of course, it's now in, in, in substantial form being overtaken by the creation of the integrated care system, which uh, is, is clearly the opportunity to develop that. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it is the, the major focus, but on the other hand, uh, it's not the one that you're going to achieve the quickest. So, you know, put it on your list, but I wouldn't put it top of your list of the immediate thing you're going to achieve. Thank you. Martin, would you like to comment? I mean, I mean really just to reiterate the importance, I think, of the ICS. I mean, when the HR, our HRP was considered, the, the ICS didn't exist yet. And I think that the reason we put them on there as a, one of the six key partners is that I think that there is the potential for them to really unlock that problem that you highlight, Jackie, for us. But, um, you know, they're very busy establishing themselves at the moment. And I uh, uh, noticed what you said, Richard, about you know, buffering to engage. And I think we, you know, we were a little bit further, because I guess they're forming at the same time as us. But there's a lot of work to be done there. Uh, and, and I think also with maybe local charity groups were another way of getting into these populations. Uh, because I think it's a real challenge, Jackie. I agree. How do you, how do you draw them in when they haven't got a badge? Thanks. Um, Professor Reid here. Uh, uh, 
And then I think we'll have one more question, so do put your hands up. Yeah. So, Scott. thanks very much, and thanks to all the panel for fantastic contributions. My question is, is sort of focusing a little bit on poor old Chris Whitty, who, who came into his role as Chief Medical Officer, I think really wanting to focus on the coastal and rural deficit in terms of access of, of people and patients to clinical trials. And then COVID happened, and as, as Richard says, some absolutely amazing things happened, but I, I think we, we finish his term and move into the next term with still that same problem. And one of the perspectives I've always found is that it's, oh, how can the, the big centres help these places that are, are, are not progressing in the same way? And I've always felt that was pretty impossible for both partners, because we just simply don't know what it's like to, to be in the situation you're in. And it's, it's perhaps difficult to imagine the situation that we're in and what's need, there's, there's such a gulf that what's needed is not necessarily what you've got. And obviously we're on a, a journey and every journey starts with, a, with small steps to get there. But it, it still kind of leaves the, the question, I think, about how do we really scale up those parts of the country that are lagging so far behind, and yet which are really only a small distance apart. And, and I, I'm not expecting answers on that. It's a bit of an observation, but I'll give you the chance. I'll throw it to Richard. <laughs> Malcolm, I, I'm, I'm pleased you raised it. Um, I, didn't, I didn't put in levelling up, uh, and I'm rather pleased in a way that we haven't focused heavily on it. But, of course, the point you make around how do you forge the partnerships to then become partnerships that deliver more than you can do solely from the... The, the assets that you have and the expertise you have within your own uh, substance. And I mean, if, if there's one thing, if, I mean, we have been feeling the winds of levelling up in London, um, quite, quite uh, blowing quite strong, uh, but it has allowed us to think more imaginatively about the ways that we could and should look at drawing a, a partnership that goes beyond your natural boundary. I mean, in a way, perhaps, I, one of the when I was thinking about what things I might show, I, uh, I suppose it's an opportunity just to illustrate what assets we have, and I've certainly learned an awful lot about the assets that are here, and they are different and complementary in many guises, and I think it requires some rather more imaginative thinking. But just to kind of give you one, uh, just a reminder, uh, you know, th 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 there is complexity in all of this. In, I, I mentioned the two boroughs we're now working in, and with directly, of course, we've always historically been working with it. North, uh, uh, North Southwark, uh, North Lambeth, and the Thames, you go to the bottom end of those same boroughs, there's a 10 year differential in life expectancy in that short distance. And so, you know, we've got some serious things to sort of focus on uh, uh, around uh, the issues that are pertaining here. Thank you. I have a question here. Just behind Malcolm. Thank you very much. Um, Anya Sinclair Jones, I'm a consultant pharmacist in Brighton, and I work quite a lot with Zambia and the Brighton Lusaka Health Link. And I wondered if you have thought about including global health in, in, into your schemes, because there is a lot of money around, and we are volunteers. There's no way we can even do the applications. I mean, I don't know if any of you have done a set application. It's just appalling. So, um, and now, I know there's a big grant coming. Set wants us to pay them for the admin. Why should we pay Set if we could pay, you know, contribute to, to the income of, of your unit? I'll just, I don't want to hog this, but I, I took out of my slide, or perhaps didn't reference to it, you know, we, we got quite a big footprint in global health and the number of anchor positions here. Uh, of course, that fluctuates in terms of whether government likes to see those activities uh, or not in terms of funding. But, but, you know, this is a really important part of what we see as, you know, the mantra of the broader partnership and indeed the role we hold as, uh, as universities that have a global responsibility. I think, going, if I may, uh, going back to Malcolm's point, I, I would argue those are the areas where we could do very well in working in partnership because, you know, these are not easy things to develop and certainly very difficult to sustain. And our approach certainly in global health is not to dip in and come out, but to be very much uh, uh, there to develop sustainable healthcare 
uh, processes. So I think you know partnership is is a very definite uh, route to success there. Did you want to comment? Uh, um, not 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 to add a lot. I mean, yes, there's a short answer to your question. I mean, clearly NIHR has. Uh, uh, interest in global health and, and, and investment there, and the, and the strength of the global health team here is, is is very strong, as you say. So absolutely in remit, and we've got a lot to take from that. I think, yeah. So on that note, we've got lots to do. I would like to thank um, Richard and Nikki and Martin and Scott for really fascinating talks, and to thank you for sort of challenge and and commentary. We've, we've got a board meeting this afternoon where we'll be thinking what does success look like? So a lot of food for thought there. Um, so may I um, thank you all for coming and also encourage you to stay for lunch and also to meet our various partners who have stalls around. I've, I'm sure there'll be something, many things for everybody. So um, maybe finally thank the speakers. Thank you.